congratulations, true crime addicts. We've survived another week. It's Friday, October 20th, 2023. This week, Richard Allen's defense team says, you can't fire me, I quit. Jorn Vandersloot confesses, and Caitlin Armstrong is still a hot mess. Stay tuned. Yes, super excited. We are all pumped to have James Author Renner. James Renner. Expects that James Renner has zeroed in. James Renner's once again drops a bombshell. Bomb Investigative journalist Renner. reporter James Renner, who's been James on the podcast Renner. a long time. Friend of mine. Writer, James Renner. Welcome back to True Crime This Week with me, James Renner. No, I'm not the fake elector from Michigan that's in a lot of trouble right now. I'm the other James Renner. Uh, as always, I want to say thank you to Walter for manning the camera. Walter's just back from eastern Tibet, where he's been hanging out with some Buddhist monks. Uh, I hope you're listening to my other podcast, Philosophy of Crime. The Philosophy of Crime, which premiered its sixth season a couple weeks ago, and I'm releasing two episodes every week now. This week was Psychopaths and the Bicameral Mind, a trippy look into a new theory on consciousness. And then just yesterday, I released uh, why some people confess to crimes they didn't commit, which is all about false confession. So if you're into that sort of thing, if that's your cup of tea, check out the philosophy of crime. Let's get to the top stories. There's lots to talk about this week. No doubt top story this week is the Delphi murder case and all the craziness happening there. In a surprising turn of events, Richard Allen's defense team withdrew from his murder case yesterday after an associate of one of the attorneys leaked gruesome photographs from the crime scene. Richard Allen, as you know, stands accused of murdering Libby German and Abby Williams in 2017. The two girls went for a walk over Monon High Bridge in Delphi, Indiana, where a killer was waiting. Their bodies were discovered the next day in the woods not far from the bridge. One of them had managed to capture an image of the likely killer, who looks a lot like Richard Allen, on uh, the cell phone. The case went cold for a number of years, though, and slowly gained in that time an immense following online, especially on Reddit message boards and Facebook posts, where rumors percolated and annoyed detectives. A review of the case last year led police to arrest Richard Allen for the murders. A search of his house turned up a gun matching the sort used in the crime, and he allegedly confessed to the crime multiple times while in custody. Some of those in conversations over the phone with his wife. His attorneys, Andrew Baldwin, probably the least famous of the Baldwin brothers, and Bradley Rossi, Rossi, Rossi have been representing Allen and their conduct has been peculiar, to say the least. Earlier this year, Allen's attorneys, that would be Baldwin and Rossi, uh, they filed documents with the court that presented the theory that Libby and Abby were not killed by Allen, but by a cult of Odin worshippers who had also infiltrate, infiltrated the local jail. Odin, of course, is a Norse god and father of Chris Hemsworth. Then a couple weeks ago, someone started leaking photographs of the crime scene. The horrific images were quietly traded among armchair sleuths before they began to appear online. One widely circulated photo shows a tree with blood marks on it. That led some online creeps to suggest that the marks were some kind of pagan symbol left behind by the killer. By the way, not for nothing, but secret cults have never killed children in this way in the United States. They likely don't exist uh, outside of TV series and movies. When cults kill people here, it's usually mass suicide, um, you know, in Kool-Aid, things like that. The whole theory of these Odin worshipers is just a distraction and, and stupid. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm glad personally, I'm personally glad these attorneys are off the case now. These photographs were also sent to the hosts of the popular Murder Sheet podcast, which had been covering the Delphi case for a while. Hosts Anya Kane and Kevin Greenlee have consistently revealed new information in this case, and their coverage, I believe, was likely responsible for pushing authorities to take a new look at the case, leading them to Allen. I think 
Anya and Kevin have done a great job breaking this case wide open. The Murder Sheet came out with two episodes this week discussing the photographs, and I urge you, if you're at all interested, to listen to these episodes. Anya and Kevin talk about how the photographs were leaked to them. They immediately, when they got these photographs, by the way, they immediately reached out to police. They did not publish them, of course, and eventually they deleted them. Um, they went to the police, and an investigation by the police uncovered the leaker. The leak, that leaker was connected to the law office representing Richard Allen. This man was able to get images from the defense team and leak them to another source. That source then sent them to the murder sheet. That leaker, by the way, has since died by suicide. So this whole thing is quite tragic. Which brings us to yesterday, when Baldwin and Rossi withdrew themselves from the case under immense pressure from the media, and they were not happy to go. Baldwin got an attorney of his own when he realized he was in trouble, and that attorney argued that these photos would have come out anyway during the trial, so what's the big deal? Uh, quote, Mr. Baldwin trusted a friend to respect his office space. This is from a morning court filing. And, uh, quote, he was betrayed, end quote. Baldwin promised to start, he, in these filings, he said, oh, I'll start locking my door. But by the end of the day, both attorneys had withdrawn. It's possible they would have been kicked off the case from the judge, which would have not looked good on their record. So I don't think they really had a choice here. And now Allen has no defense. A new attorney must be appointed to represent him. Until then, nothing happens. No word yet as to whether the trial will have to be delayed. This, of course, opens a can of worms for an eventual appeal should he be convicted. In short, it's a shit show in Delphi as it has been from the beginning. Who had a confession in the Natalie Holloway case on their 2023 bingo card? I certainly didn't. On Wednesday, though, convicted douche canoe Jorn Vandersloot confessed in detail to the 2005 murder of Natalie Holloway in Aruba. Jorn was the last person to be seen with Natalie before she disappeared. He's been the lead suspect ever since. Jorn was in court facing charges of extortion and wire fraud for trying to get $250,000 from Natalie's family in exchange for telling them about the murder. Can't do that. Prosecutors offered Jorn a plea deal if he confessed to Natalie's murder and told them what happened. His sentence for the extortion and wire fraud would be served consecutively, or concurrently, that is, concurrently with his 28-year sentence for the 2010 murder of Stephanie Flores. He got caught after he murdered another young woman who spurned his advances. Uh, this means that he won't serve extra time for... Uh, confessing to Natalie's murder. Jorn is currently serving that sentence for Stephanie Flores' murder in a prison in Peru. Jorn took the plea deal and finally provided the truth about what happened to Natalie in Aruba, according to CNN. Jorn says he was walking Natalie back to her hotel that night, walking along the beach, and uh, he tried to feel her up, in his words. She refused and then knead him, in the <clears throat> knead him in the groin, which is just, just wonderful, isn't it? Um, Jorn responded, though, by kicking her in the head, which rendered Natalie unconscious. He looked around, saw a cinder block laying nearby, picked up the cinder block and dropped it on her face, killing her. Then he took her body into the ocean and pushed it out to sea. Her body was never recovered. Unfortunately, Jorn cannot be prosecuted for Natalie's murder, since Aruba has a 12-year statute of limitations on murder. But his confession finally gives Natalie's family an answer they've been searching for for nearly 20 years. But don't worry, Jorn will be in prison until at least 2045, since he got an additional 18 years added to his sentence for trafficking cocaine in prison. What a stand-up guy. And finally, a court in New Mexico found a man guilty this week for killing Jesus Christ. This story is bonkers. There's a lot to unpack here, but here we go. In 2017, Siraj Ibn Wahaj picked his three-year-old son, Abdul Gahani, picked him up from his mother's home. 
and he told uh, Abdul Gahani's mother that he was just taking him to the park. That was a lie. Instead, Siraj kidnapped Abdul Gahani and drove him to the end of the world compound in the New Mexico desert, according to the Guardian. This facility that Siraj took him to, uh, prosecutors say, was used by Siraj's family to train children in firearms and tactical training to prepare them for attacks against the government. Three-year-old Abdul Gahani could not walk. He suffered from a condition that caused seizures that required medication. But Siraj's family believed that these seizures were caused by genies and demons that were possessing the boy. So they stopped giving him the medication and instead prayed over him for hours and attempted an exorcism. They believed that Abdul Gahani would be resurrected as Jesus Christ and would then give them further instructions on the war to come. During one attempted exorcism, the boy's heart stopped and he could not be revived. Police raided the cult's compound in 2018 and discovered Abdul Gahani's body in an underground tunnel. The raid also resulted in the rescue of 11 other children, ranging in age from 1 to 15, who all appeared to be malnourished. On Tuesday, Siraj was convicted of terrorism charges and now faces a lengthy prison sentence. Now, when I hear a story like this, I always wonder how many crazy people are still out there that we don't know about doing stuff like this. We're just hearing about the ones that are caught. That means there's several more, uh, you know, to the tune of, you know, an exponential number that haven't been caught that are still flying under the radar. Pay attention to your neighbors is what I'm saying. Someone out there is up to no good. And uh, those are the top stories. Stay with me, though. There's lots more to come after the break. Uh, updates in the Rex Hewerman case with Gilgo Beach murders and, um, and more. I'll be back in two and two. Please hang up and try again. And welcome back to Bad Cats, starring Michelle Pfeiffer. Hey, are you looking for a new house in this gloomy economy? Well, I've got the deal for you. Mazel, the former estate of Alex Murdoch, is on the mar market for the low, low price of $1.95 million, according to CBS News. Alex Murdoch, known in some circles as Creepy Eyes McGee, was convicted of murdering his wife and son earlier this year, and he won't be needing it anytime soon. Here's the Zillow listing. The Mazel estate consists of 5,275 square feet of house, and 21 acres of land. Beyond the stately brick columns awaits a long, impressive oak line driveway, leading to a quintessential southern vision of the classic and traditionally styled home with stunning high-end features such as pine flooring and a sportsman's room. How lovely. Also included are top-of-the-line appliances, a billiards room, and the ghosts of Murdoch's many victims. You know, I'm thinking here, maybe we could all chip in like $5 and buy this place and then bulldoze it and put in a Planet Fitness. Caitlin Armstrong is back in the news this week. Remember this, uh, this woman? She's the Texas lady who's charged with the murder of a professional cyclist named Anna Wilson who had gone on a date with Armstrong's boyfriend. After the murder, she disappeared and U.S. Marshals went looking for her. She managed to elude capture for 43 days by using her sister's passport to fly to Costa Rica, where she dyed her hair and used a number of fake identities. She may have even gotten a nose job after, after her trip there to alter her appearance. Now, after a while, now she just would have laid low. I don't know how long she would have gone before she got captured, but she got bored and she started dating again and teaching yoga at uh, Santa Teresa Beach. And that's where they found her, teaching yoga. Anyways, last week she allegedly faked a leg injury to convince jail guards to take her to an orthopedic clinic, according to Fox News. As she was leaving, she ran from officers who chased her for over a mile before capturing her again. Investigators believe she MacGyvered her escape using a metal pin and dental floss to unlock her handcuffs. And when they reviewed, reviewed jail camera recordings, they discovered that she'd been training for weeks. They saw her doing all these push-ups and, and stretches and, and running in place, and she was preparing for this for quite some time. 
Uh, she's scheduled to go on trial October 30th, as long as she doesn't run again. Long Island police are investigating Rex Hewerman's connection to two more murders, according to the Daily Beast. Hewerman, a New York architect, was arrested earlier this year for the Gilgo Beach serial murders and is awaiting trial on those. In a press conference earlier this week, Suffolk County Police Commissioner Rodney Harrison and Attorney John Ray announced that new evidence also links Hewerman to the murders of Shannon Gilbert and Karen Vergata. Both women, like Hewerman's other alleged victims, worked as escorts. Ray said that four witnesses have come forward with statements that connect the dead women to Hewerman. One witness claims they went to Hewerman's house for a sex party in 1996 with her boy boyfriend and Vergata. Strangely, this witness says Hewerman's wife was also there at the time. The witness later left with her boyfriend, and Vergata stayed behind with Hewerman and his wife, never to be seen again. Another witness who works as a taxi driver saw Gilbert with Hewerman when she picked Gilbert up in the fall of 2009. At the time, Gilbert had locked herself in a bathroom at a motor lodge, and Hewerman was seen exiting the room when the cab driver arrived to pick her up. We may never know the full extent of Hewerman's crimes, but he appears to have been quite prolific before finally being caught. On October 27, 1986, someone broke into Teresa Scalf's home in Polk County, Florida, and stabbed her to death. The murder was particularly violent. Teresa's head had been nearly severed from her body, but for almost 37 years, police had no suspect. But earlier this week, Polk County Sheriff Grady Judd announced that Teresa's killer was her neighbor, Donald Douglas, who was 33 years old at the time, according to Law and Crime. In 2022, the police sent DNA from the crime scene to our friends over at Othram Labs. Genetic genealogy then linked Douglas to the murder. Unfortunately, Douglas died of natural causes in 2008. Strangely, Douglas had no criminal history, and detectives believe the murder happened after a rejected sexual advance. Before her murder, Teresa had told family members that a neighbor was stalking her. Nice work, guys. And uh, how about a little weird news? This is strange. This is one of the stories that, like, is about a, I guess, kind of like a snowball rolling down hills. Things start, and then what you end up with the end is not quite what anybody expected. Um, here's how it begins. There was a proper Donnybrook in a Texas courthouse this week. On Tuesday morning, 19-year-old Frank DeLeon uh, pleaded guilty for the murder of his girlfriend, 16-year-old Diamond Alvarez, in a Houston courtroom, according to ABC 13. He accepted a sentence of 45 years in prison. But all hell broke loose after Diamond's mother, Anna Mikado, gave her victim's impact statement. From the stand, she called De Leon a monster and said his mother had raised him to be that way. And as she was walking back to his, her seat, she attempted to walk over to De Leon before a court official restrained her. That's when Diamond's uncle rushed towards De Leon for a little street justice. And then De Leon's mother went after Anna. Soon the courtroom was in chaos and someone pushed a panic button sending an alert to all officers in the courthouse. Court officials left what they were doing and ran to the courtroom to help, and that caused another problem. A sheriff's deputy was watching over another convict named Michael Devon Combs, who had just come from a court appearance for assaulting his girlfriend, where the judge had revoked his bond. He was on his way back to jail. The deputy left Combs alone to break up the fight, and Combs took the opportunity to shimmy out of his leg shackles and stroll out of the building. A manhunt is currently under the way, underway to recapture Combs, who has a history of domestic violence, but to date, he remains on the run. Over to pop culture. Killers of the Flower Moon is out this week. You gotta check it out. It's on the top of my list. This Martin Scorsese-directed adaptation of the nonfiction novel Killers of the Flower Moon should be a good watch. Uh, now this, if you don't know, is based on the book by the same name, which is a nonfiction thriller. Uh, it's, it's about something that really happened. This is a true story. Here's the write-up. Uh, the book investigates a series of murders of wealthy Osage people 
that took place in Osage County, Oklahoma in the early 1920s, after big oil deposits were discovered beneath their land. Has anything good ever happened after the discovery of oil? Um, after the Osage are awarded rights in court to the profits made from oil deposits found on their land, the Osage people prepared to receive the wealth to which they are legally entitled. The Osage viewed, were viewed as the middleman, and there's this complex plot that is hatched to eliminate the Osage inheritors on a one-by-one -one basis by any means possible. They did not want to share their profits with the Osage people. Uh, officially, the count of the wealthy Osage victims reaches at least 20, but it's suspected that uh, there it could be in the hundreds. Um, the book details the newly formed FBI's investigation of the murders, as well as the eventual trial and conviction of cattleman William King Hale as the mastermind behind the plot. And for the book this week, um, I heard about this guy in the news, and uh, so I'm recommending this this book. It's, it's, it's not a true crime case, but it is crime adjacent, as they say these days, because it has, uh, if this guy's right, it has, it has uh, significant impacts uh, down the line, uh, significant impacts coming for the criminal justice system, uh, which is just, you know, let me just get to the book. Let me tell you about it. The book is called Behave, The Biology of Humans at Our Best and Worst. Here's the write-up. From the best-selling author of a primate's memoir and the forthcoming determined a science of life without free will comes a landmark genre-defining examination of human behavior and an answer the, to the question, why do we do the things that we do? Behave is one of the most dazzling tours of the science of human behavior ever attempted. Moving across a range of disciplines, Sapolsky, that's the author, I forgot to mention, uh, a neuroscience and primatologist uncovers the hidden story of our actions, undertaking some of the thorniest questions relating to tribalism and xenophobia. Uh, behave is a towering achievement for good and for ill. What it's getting at, what Sapolsky is supposing, is that we do not have free will. We just don't. All of our actions can be traced down to um, the, the smallest chemical reactions in our body, in our physiology, and the, the, the experiences that we've had of, uh, of people. And these things that we encounter as choices aren't really choices because it's already kind of wired into us how we're going to react. And what this is getting at is that murderers may not be culpable for their crimes ever not just in some circumstances, but that they were hardwired to commit that murder from the very beginning and because of the circumstances that happen in their lives in between. So it's a crazy theory. Sapolsky does not believe we have free will. It scares me a little to think about, but uh, the, the older I get, the more evidence I see that, uh, you know, the, the control is an illusion. So check it out. Behave. The biology of humans at our best and worst. And that's the show for this week. Man, it was a long one, right? Um, check out Philosophy of Crime, and I'll be back next week. Same bat channel, same bat place. And in the meantime, it it's officially the weekend now. Go out and have fun. It's time to celebrate. And in the words of the incomparable, Marie Saul, the godfather of Cleveland Radio, that means we got to, 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 got to. Get down, damn it. True Crime This Week is a Fearful Symmetry production. Photo and artwork are licensed through Shutterstock. If you like the cut of my jib, I have another podcast you might enjoy called The Philosophy of Crime, in which I attempt to solve the big questions behind our true crime obsession by looking to philosophy for answers. Thank you for listening. I'll see you next week. Sit, Brownie, sit. Good dog.